Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, bear with me. I have a few things at the top. So I want to start by saying that what the country witnessed last night was historic. We saw the leadership we always see from Joe Biden. We saw a man who, as he has always done, put country first. Surrounded by his family, you heard the president say, I revere this office, but I love my country more. He went on to say, the defense of democracy is more important than any title. I draw strength and find joy in working for the American people. But this sacred task of perfecting our union is not about me. It's about you, your families, your futures. It's about we, the people. And I have decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation that is the best way to unite our nation. This is a selfless act, something that very few politicians would ever do. President Biden will go down in history as one of the nation's greatest presidents, accomplishing more in nearly four years than most presidents do in eight years. To quote him again, I have given my heart and my soul to our nation like so many others have, and I have been blessed a million times in return with the love and support of the American people. He made clear last night that over the next six months, he will be focused on doing his job as President of the United States and building on his historic results for the American people. That is his focus. And I will end by saying that I am so proud to work for this man who has served his country for more than 50 years with honor and dignity. And I look forward to working, continuing to work with him again for ahead, ahead in the next several months. Uh, today, the Department of Homeland Security released additional data on the impacts of the ex 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 executive action President Biden announced on June 4th. Since then, encounters at the border between ports of entry have dropped more than 55%. Average daily encounters are now lower than they were at the end of the previous administration and lower than at this point back in 2019. But we know the only way to bring lasting solutions to secure border, to secure, to secure the border, and to begin to fix the broken immigration system is to pass the bipartisan border security agreement. Sadly, congressional Republicans have decided to put partisan politics ahead of our national security and twice voted against the bipartisan agreement and badly needed resources to hire additional border po policy uh, patrol agents and fentanyl detection technology at the border. In the absence of legislation action, legislative action, the Biden-Harris administration has taken decisive actions to secure the border. Recently, the administration has taken action to hold criminal organizations accountable, including sanctions against different gangs and smuggling organizations that are responsible for various criminal activities. That includes human smuggling and trafficking, gender-based violence, and money laundering. We have also taken concrete steps to make our immigration system more fair and more just and to keep families together. That is why in August, eligible spouses of U.S. citizens and their children who have lived here for 10 years or more will be able to apply for legal status while remaining in the United States with their families. We are also helping young people who have been educated in the U.S., including DREAMers and DACA recipients, receive work visas more quickly. These actions will help more young people use their talents to enrich our communities and strengthen our economy. This administration will continue taking action to secure our border and fix our broken immigration system. Now, when President Biden took office, we were in the midst of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. But as the president said last night during his Oval Office address, and as today's GDP report makes clear, the United States has the strongest economy in the world. This did not happen by accident. Under the leadership of President Biden and Vice President Harris, we saw the economy grow a strong 2.8% last quarter with business investments more, up more than 5%. Nearly 16 million jobs have been created and wages are up higher than before the pandemic with inflation down to 3%. But as the president said, we have more work to do. 
Over the next six months, the president and vice president will keep fighting to lower costs for hard working families, from lowering health care and housing costs to making billionaires pay their fair share and cutting taxes for families with the child tax credit. While congressional Republicans side with special interests and threaten Social Security and Medicare, the president and vice president will continue fighting for the middle class. Today, we are praying for the thousands of Americans under mandatory evacuation orders out west as widespread wildfires burn hundreds of thousands of acres across Oregon, California, and elsewhere. We are grateful for the brave firefighters and first responders who are working to protect people and save lives. We urge everyone in the, in the affected areas to remain vigilant and heed the warnings of local officials, especially those who have been ordered to evacuate. In, the president has been briefed on the fires and we are in close touch with the governor's office, uh, offices in affected states to ensure they have all that they need. White House and federal officials are also in close contact with state and local officials on the front lines of these fires and 6,800 federal personnel from the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Interior are on the ground helping to fight the blazes and keep people safe. The Department of Defense has also mobilized four of its C-130 modular airborne firefighting systems to support fire suppression's effort. FEMA also uh, issued several fire management assistance grants to help reimburse states for firefighting costs. As always, we stay ready to provide further support as needed. And finally, on Monday, Iowa's extreme abortion ban will take effect banning care before a lot of women even know that they are pregnant. I will be the 22nd state with an abortion ban in effect. All of these bans imposed by the Republican elected officials put women's health and lives in jeopardy. The president and the vice president have been clear this should never happen in America, yet this is exactly what is happening in states across the country since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And it's not stopping at the state level. Republican elected officials in Congress have proposed four, four national abortion bans while refusing to protect nationwide access to IVF and contraception. President Biden and Vice President Harris believe that women in every state must have the right to make deeply personal decisions about their health care. They continue to call on Congress to restore the protections of Roe v. Wade into federal law and fight efforts by Republican elected officials to undermine our fundamental freedoms. And with that, I will turn it over to the Admiral, Admiral John Kirby, who's here to take questions about the Prime Minister uh, of Israel's visit and meeting with the President today and take any questions on the Middle East. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you all know, the President and the Prime Minister are meeting right now uh, in the Oval Office. Um, there's a lot on the agenda, but first and foremost, we'll be discussing uh, how deeply and how strongly um, uh, the President feels, we feel, that we've got to get this hostage deal in place so we can get a ceasefire uh, also in place, uh, at least for phase one for that first, uh, those first six weeks. There are gaps that remain, uh, and our team continues to work with our counterparts uh, in the region to see if we can't close those gaps. We believe that they are of a nature where they can be closed and that we can achieve uh, a deal, but it's going to require, as it always does, some leadership, some compromise, uh, and an effort to get there. Uh, the President will be reaffirming for Prime Minister Netanyahu that he believes we need to get there and that we need to get there soon. Today, <coughs> is the 293rd day that these hostages have been held captive by Hamas. And you just have to assume uh, that it is the most horrific of circumstances. And sadly, we know that not all of them are alive. Still hostages, still need to get home to their families. 293 days, there ought not to be a 294th. Uh, and we're gonna keep working on that. Um, uh, I do anticipate that the two leaders will also, also have a chance to talk about other substantive issues um, uh, in terms of the blue line up at the north uh, and making sure we don't see an escalation of the conflict 
uh, between Israel and, uh, and uh, Lebanon and uh, make sure that we're providing opportunities for both Israeli and Lebanese citizens to return to their homes, uh, as well as, of course, the need, the critical need for stability in the West Bank. We're still seeing violence in the West Bank that the president has been absolutely steadfast uh, calling out as unacceptable. They'll also discuss the United States' ironclad commitment, of course, to Israel's security, including countering the very serious threats that Iran and its proxy groups continue to demonstrate throughout the region. The President and the Prime Minister, of course, after their meeting today in the Oval, will have a chance to meet with uh, families of the Americans that are being held hostage by Hamas. This will be the President's second in-person meeting with these families. But as you all know, we have kept up a regular drumbeat of uh, interaction with them. Since the 7th of October, Jake Sullivan's met with them 10, 12 times, something like that. And other members of the team have also kept in touch with them to make sure that they know everything that we're doing to get their loved ones home. Um, just quickly before we go to questions, um, uh, a quick word on Venezuela. We support the peaceful elections that we expect and hope will come on Sunday. Elections that will reflect the will and the aspirations of the Venezuelan people for a more democratic, stable, and prosperous future. Any political rep rep repression and violence is unacceptable. And of course, regardless of who wins, we encourage both candidates to commit to a peaceful outcome and to work together for the good of all Venezuelans. For that. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, first, uh, in light of the president's meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu right now, does the president believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to get a hostage deal that, given his political consideration at home in Israel, that he is actually capable and willing to bridge those gaps that you say remain? Yes, yes, and yes. He has said so publicly himself, Zeke. He wants to get the hostages home. Um, and um, the Israelis, the, the, the government, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been working uh, with us to try to get that, that deal over the finish line. That said, as I, as I mentioned at the top, there's still some gaps that remain, um, and we're going to be talking to the Prime Minister today about the, uh, closing those gaps. I just, uh, uh, on a broader note, uh, President mentioned last night that he plans to spend the next six months in uh, uh, his time in office focused on, on some foreign policy issues. Uh, how does uh, the President's announcement change what the White House, what the NSC has planned for the balance of the year through January 20th in terms of the issue of the president travel by the president when we get to Africa. You know, what were the, the, yeah. the to-do list of things that maybe had been planned for the second term that he now has to, has less than six months to get done? Well, look, now that uh, uh, that he's not running for re-election, certainly uh, you can expect that there'll be opportunities on the calendar that may not have been before. And so uh, we're all exploring what those opportunities can look like in terms of advancing his foreign policy agenda and national security uh, opportunities here and around the world, but I don't have anything on the schedule to speak to now. But I mean, you know, stay tuned. I think there'll, there'll, there'll be some opportunities that the president is going to want to explore. Look, I mean, still got a war in Ukraine, still got a war in Gaza, still got climate change to deal with, still got a very restless Indo-Pacific. I mean, I could go on and on. There's plenty of things for the national security team to try to got continue to get done. John, we heard from the Vice President earlier with comments, strict, uh, <coughs> sorry, s strong comments related to the vandalism and the protests that we saw yesterday. We haven't heard yet from the President or for the White House at large. Do you condemn what you saw yesterday? How do you characterize the protests, including what we saw at Union Station? Well, we did put out a statement uh, last night from the White House, um, but absolutely uh, condemn any violence uh, in protest activity. I mean, it's a First Amendment right to peacefully protest. We fully support that. We know that there are strong views um, about what's going on in Gaza. And some of those views uh, are in opposition to some of the policies that we're pursuing. We get it. That's democracy. But when it turns violent, and when you burn an American flag and pull it down off a U.S. government uh, b b b site, that's just absolutely unacceptable. And, and uh, obviously we condemn all that. Are these protests pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, anti-Israel? How do you characterize what we're seeing? I think it's a little bit of all those things. I mean, um, I can't speak for the protesters. Obviously, I don't share their views. Uh, but um, obviously they took great exception to uh, the prime minister speaking on Capitol Hill. And as I said, many of them have... Uh, take an exception with our with our policies with respect to Gaza. Today we heard from one of the family members who's going to be meeting with both the Prime Minister and the President a short time from now, Aviva Siegel. She was a former hostage of Hamas. She says, I want to ask President Biden if Bibi is not able or willing to agree to the ceasefire and hostage deal to bring the Americans home. Is there anything more that President Biden <laughs> is prepared to do unilaterally to try to bring those hostages home? I wouldn't get into hypothesizing uh, and speculating about 
um, options one way or the other. We want to get all the hostages home, clearly uh, the Americans in particular. And that's why this deal is so important, Peter. And we are close. Uh, we are closer now, we believe, than we've been before. Um, the gaps are closable, no question about that. Um, and we believe, the president believes, uh, that getting that hostage deal in place, getting that six-week ceasefire, that's the best way to get all these loved ones back with their families. Thank you, Kareem. Thanks, John. Did the U.S. find any of Netanyahu's remarks yesterday to be false or misleading? Uh, I'm not going to parse everything he said uh, or, you know, do a, a fact check here from, from this podium. Um, he, you know, he, he should speak for himself about what his, his views are. He should, but he had a powerful stage, a joint address before Congress. Do you agree with assertions that Iran financially backed some of the protesters, that if there are Palestinians in Gaza who aren't getting enough food, it's not because Israel is blocking it, as two examples? So on the first example, we've said ourselves, the Director of National Intelligence came out publicly and said that we do know that uh, Iran has been funding and encouraging uh, some of the protest activity here in the United States, some of it. Uh, we do not believe that all the protest activity out there on a daily basis is being fully uh, funded by Iran. There's a lot of organic concern out there in the American people about what's going on in the Middle East, and uh, m most of these protests are, are formed and, and fashioned in that regard. Um, on the second question, uh, it's a it, there has been an, a, a steady increase of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza. The problem isn't getting it to Gaza right now. The problem is getting it around Gaza. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so dang difficult to move things around inside Gaza is because there's a war going on and bombs are dropping. Uh, and regrettably, uh, in the conduct of some of their, their recent operations, the Israeli military has in fact uh, not on purpose, we have no reason to believe they did this deliberately, but there has been um, accidental uh, strikes on some of the, the trucks and the convoys that have been moving around. Um, so there's, it's, a, it's, not, it's not one or the other. There's a lot of reasons why it's not moving around, and some of that is, of course, the military activity of the Israelis uh, inside Gaza. And then, now that the Vice President is the likely Democratic nominee, has she communicated with the president whether a Harris administration's Israel policy would be the same or different as his? You would have to talk to the vice president's office uh, and the campaign for that. I would just, before I leave that though, just want to remind, she's been a full partner uh, in uh, our policies in the Middle East, particularly with our policies towards uh, Israel and the war in Gaza, a full partner, uh, been involved in nearly every conversation that the president has had with the prime minister um, and very much engaged throughout. I, okay, before I get to my questions, can I just a quick follow-up on that? Can, sure. you can you explain to the American people who might think it just looks odd that she is having her own private meeting with the prime minister separate from the president that suggests that they aren't speaking with one voice? Well, I reckon if she was here, she'd be in the room right now, but she's not physically here. There's nothing unusual about that. and. Vice President has and, and has, and I fully expect over the next six months will continue to have meetings of her own with foreign leaders. She's met privately with President Zelensky as well and others. It was 20 days ago that the administration first said that they were really optimistic about finding, uh, really closing the deal. Has nothing changed in 20 days? Is that still where we are? I wouldn't uh, say nothing's changed. What? What are the remaining gaps? <laughs> what are the sticking points? Yeah, I'm not going to negotiate in public. Um, I wouldn't say nothing's changed. I mean, those last 20 days that you talk about, and we've been working really, really hard to try to get those gaps closed. Um, there are, there's still more work to be done. Uh, but we believe, as I said earlier, we're uh, closer now than we've been before. And we think it's absolutely achievable to get this over the finish line. Just sort of following up on what you just point, there's one other thing that the Prime Minister said yesterday that's getting a lot of attention is that the conflict has had one of the lowest ratios of combatant to non-combatant casualties in the history of urban warfare. Obviously, this, our own State Department has found it reasonable to assess that the Israelis' actions at times have been inconsistent with international law. So who is correct here? And is the United States comfortable with the ratio of deaths between yeah, combatants? Yeah, I, I'm not going to go line by line through the Prime Minister's speech um, and, and debate it here from the White House podium. Um, he should speak for his comments. He should speak for um, his views. What I can do is speak for ours. And the right number of civilian casualties is zero. 
and there has been too many civilian casualties in this fighting in Gaza. And as I just indicated in my previous answer, there continue to be civilian casualties in, in this war in Gaza. There continues to be desperate need for food, water, medicine, uh, because it's a combat zone in many places. Um, and we need to bring the war to an end. And one of the principal things that the president president's going to talk to the prime minister about today is how we get there. How do we end this war? And the best way, in his view, is to get this deal in place. Get a six-week ceasefire. Get phase one going so you negotiate to phase two. Get a cessation of hostilities and more critically, get those hostages home. Good day. Um, thanks, Green. Thanks, Admiral. Um, you mentioned in your top of the word compromises. Um, it, does the president believe that specifically that Prime Minister Netanyahu needs to make compromises uh, to achieve a ceasefire deal, uh, and it's not just Hamas. And also, what are those compromises that Netanyahu would have to make? If so? Both sides have to make compromises, and because we still have gaps that haven't been closed, I think you can surmise from that that there are still compromises that need to be made. Um, the uh, Israelis already have made many compromises to get us to this point. Hamas, through their interlocutors have made compromises to get us to this point, and yet we're still not there. So there's still, there's still a need for compromise. And will the President be saying to Prime Minister Netanyahu, you need to make compromises? Well, we're going to do a readout, and we'll, we'll tell you how the meeting went after it's over. Uh, but as I said in, in the opening statement, uh, this will be a, a prime topic of discussion, that it's time now to get these compromises in place. It's time now to get the negotiation in place and get the hostages home. It's time to end the war. Good awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, how does the administration reconcile the comments that the president has made about the fact that Hamas has been decimated, its military objectives achieved, as he said some weeks ago, and the fact that we heard the prime minister again reiterate that he wants total victory? How do you all reconcile those two visions? I don't think they need to be reconciled. I think they're, they're, uh, both things can be true. We do believe that from a military perspective, Hamas has been uh, very, very badly beaten uh, and uh, and, uh, and denigrated, no question about that. Doesn't mean they've been eliminated. They still have leadership in place. They still can direct operations. They still have fighters at, at their beck and call. Uh, and we're seeing that every day. Um, and we also still believe that they need to be defeated, uh, that the threat to Israel needs to be eliminated from Hamas, and that whatever the post-war situation looks like, it can't end with Hamas being in, in control over Gaza. So I don't think that the two things are necessarily irreconcilable or, or at odds with one another. Thank you. Well, two questions. So to what extent the war in Gaza has impacted the President's ambitious project IMF corridor, and is I2U2 being talked, discussed today in the bilateral meeting? For the IMF corridor? I think it's too soon to know whether there's going to be a big impact on that. The president's absolutely still committed to it. We've still got the teams uh, uh, pulling together and working on that. It, it's uh, got great promise for uh, infrastructure um, and investment opportunities across that whole corridor, uh, not only just for the movement of, of <coughs> commerce, uh, but the jobs that it will create just in, just in its establishment. And secondly, uh, president's another key initiative has been required. Right. Is President still committed to attending the Quad Summit being hosted by India this year? We're still committed to there being a Quad Leader Summit this year, but there's nothing on the calendar right now for it. Thank you. Okay. John, the meeting with the hostage families this afternoon that you referenced, can you just give us a sense of what message the President and Prime Minister want to bring to those families? What are they going to say? Uh, I won't speak for the Prime Minister, but the President um, uh, intends to tell them how uh, seriously, he's still committed to getting this deal in place and getting their loved ones home. He's going to tell them that uh, we're going to maintain the contact with them that we have had, uh, that there's not, not going to be a gap in communication as we get uh, as we get closer here, hopefully to the end, um, and that he's not going to rest until all their loved ones are back. The, the pool was in the Oval Office briefly for the beginning of their meeting, and the two men were friendly and cordial, <coughs> and President Biden was joking about how old he was. <coughs> first had a meeting with a, a previous Prime Minister. But we know that there have been tensions between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden. What's your, can you talk a little bit about the state of their relationship right now? It's a healthy relationship. And by healthy, I mean, they're not gonna agree on everything. Um, they haven't, they haven't through the long political lives that both of them have, um, have enjoyed, always agreed on everything. They come from two different political traditions, but they know one another. Um, I believe I can. I don't speak for President Biden that that that, that, uh, that he's very comfortable 
um, in the relationship that he has with the prime minister and the ability that he has. He would do it anyway, but certainly with with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the ability that he has to be candid and honest um, and lay it all out there, and he'll he'll do that today. Um, did the president watch the, the prime minister's speech yesterday or see anything that he? I, I don't know if he. I don't know if he watched it. I, I don't know that. Um, and you didn't. Do you have a sense of his reaction? I don't. Okay. Uh, and um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. You know, that was easy. Um, do you think that Maduro has the ability to kind of fully rig the election, or do you think that he w it's more likely that he would just contest the results? It's difficult to know exactly how this is going to play out, so I can't really answer that specifically. But, but well, the reason I mentioned it in my opening statement is to make it clear to Mr. Maduro that we're watching. We're watching closely. They need to be free and fair elections, free of repression, free of voter intimidation. Um, and again, no matter who wins, uh, our expectation is that the winner is going to continue to look after democratic institutions in Venezuela. But, so if the opposition does win, are you concerned about violence that might break out? If we weren't concerned about the possibility, I wouldn't have mentioned it in the opening statement. Gotcha. Uh, thank you. Uh, Admiral, two questions on Iran. Um, how is the POTUS Biden going to deal with Iran? I mean, which aspects of dealing with Iran is he going to prioritize in the next six months in office, and w which one of them would he be recommending to be POTUS Harris if and when she gets to the White House again? And my second She's already at the White House. She's already a key partner in our foreign policy objectives. I, if I would t tell you that uh, you're going to continue to see over the next six months the same focus by this administration and this team, which of course includes the Vice President on holding Iran accountable for all their destabilizing activities, support to the Houthis, to Hezbollah, to Hamas, the merchant uh, attacks that they're allowing the Houthis to continue to perpetrate and that they're perpetrating themselves uh, in the Gulf region, as well as their support to Russia and Russia's war in Ukraine. I could go on and on. We have sanctioned Iran some 600 different times just in the last three and a half years of this administration. We'll continue to hold them accountable. That will be a steady focus for the president. Israeli really Prime Minister yesterday uh, labeled those part of the protesters as uh, Iran's useful idiots. Uh, what is the administration's uh, method of dealing with them? I mean, what is it? Well, first of all, that's not a phrase we would use. As I mentioned, I think, to Peter's question, uh, we know that uh, Iran certainly has tried to meddle here. They've tried to sow discord. They've obviously contributed to some funding of some protesters, but um, I, I think to, to paint everybody with that brush is un unfortunate and not, and not an accurate reflection. Um, uh, most of the protest activity here in the United States is peaceful. Most of it is, uh, by the vast majority of it, is organic. It comes from people who have real concerns. Um, and that's what a democracy is all about. And do you agree with the... Uh, 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 with the Prime Minister's uh, assertion that uh, basically the uh, Israel is protecting U.S. Uh, I mean, uh, why um, is it sort of an overt criticism from leader of an ally? And what does U.S. need protection from an ally? I'm sorry, can you? Yeah. Well, he said when Israel fights Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, we are fighting Iran. When Israel acts to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons, we're not only protecting ourselves, we're protecting you. So why does the U.S. need protection from an ally? Um, isn't the U.S. doing enough? It is cl clear that, uh, that Israel and the United States share a, a concern about Iran's activities. Um, and the prime minister is not wrong. When, you, um, when you're going after groups like Hezbollah or Hamas in this case particularly, uh, or when we together try to defend each other uh, against the Houthi missiles and drones that continue to fly, um, that that is also uh, because of the proxy na na nature of it, also uh, countering Iran's activities. I mean, together, that's what allies and partners do. Thanks, John. Um, just to take the long view of this, um, very early in uh, President Biden's presidency, February the 4th, 2021. He spoke at the State Department about his priorities in foreign policy. And he said that one of those priorities was reclaiming our credibility and moral authority. Um, the Prime Minister of Israel is in the judgment of uh, the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, a war criminal. 
um, isn't posting an alleged war criminal in the Oval Office undermining of credibility and moral authority? No, because we don't consider him a war criminal. But the uh, International Criminal Court does. We don't agree. And as we've said before, we don't find the ICC's uh, finding to be uh, relevant or appropriate in this case. We don't find him to be a war criminal. He's an ally and a partner and a friend. Well, the, the chief prosecutor says that uh, Israel does have legitimate uh, war aims, of course, but the way Israel chose to achieve these in Gaza, namely intentionally causing death, starvation, great suffering, and serious injury to body or health of the civilian population, are criminal. Is that a question? Because if it is, if it is, I've already answered it. We don't consider him a war criminal. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Um, thank, yes, she called me. I thought thank, she said Jenny. Thank you very much. That was Jenny? Yeah. My bad. Thank no, you. It's all good. Thank you, Colleen, and uh, thank you, John. Uh, I have two questions. Recently, American families who were victims of Hamas filed a lawsuit against the North Korea authorities in the U.S. federal court, demanding $1 billion in compensation from North Korea, claiming that uh, North Korea was responsible because the weapons used by Hamas were weapons supported by North Korea. What is your comment on this? Well, look, uh, Mr. Kim continues to export uh, military capability, um, and we continue to work with allies and partners and counterparts to, to hold them accountable for that. They're also exporting technology and weapon systems to Russia so they can kill innocent Ukrainians. Um, so I, I mean, we're going to continue to hold them accountable for that kind of behavior. If you are also second question, if Vice President Kamala Harris is elected the next president, will she continue the foreign policy keep going on between U.S. and South Korea, or change? I, I uh, am not going to speak for a hypothetical electoral outcome, and I'm certainly not going to speak for uh, the vice president in this regard. You really should talk to her team and, uh, and her campaign. Okay, John. Thanks, Corrine. John, uh, the president has been pushing for a peace deal, a ceasefire, for weeks, if not months. Now that he has announced that he's not running for another term, how if in any way that complicates those efforts to reach a peace deal? We don't believe it does. And in the conversations that we've been having in just recent hours, uh, there's no reason to suspect that his decision not to run for re-election is going to have an impact on our ability to get the deal done. What's going to have an impact, as I said before, is leadership. Leadership on all sides and uh, the ability to continue to compromise. We are close. We just have to finish it. The president also last night spoke about his goals uh, in his remaining six months in office, one of those goals is to get back those wrongfully detained Americans, uh, people like Evan Gershkovich from the Wall Street Journal. And Paul Whalen. And Paul Whalen, exactly. Uh, the president has been described by some as a lame duck president. Does it complicate those efforts to get back those wrongfully detained Americans? I can assure you that we continue to work extremely hard at getting all the wrongfully detained Americans around the world, including those in Russia that we've been talking about, getting them home where they belong. They don't need to, they, there's no reason for them to be detained. The whole team is working on this around the clock. I can absolutely assure you that. Okay, I'll start wrapping up. Um, thank you, thank you for the answer. Also the last question. Um, I, uh, yesterday, um, Netanyahu asked the U.S. to fast track weapons in his speech. Um, I'm wondering if the president is considering lifting his pause on the 2,000-pound bombs that the Israelis have requested. No change to that policy uh, at this time, and I would just uh, <coughs> add that um, that is the only shipment of the only type of weaponry that has been held up, that all the military security assistance that had been going to Israel continues to go to Israel. They are still getting the tools, the capabilities, and the weapons that they need for the fight that they're in. Thanks, John. Thanks, Green. What conversations has President Biden had with Vice President Kamala Harris ahead of her meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister? I won't speak to private conversations between the President and the Vice President. I wouldn't do that on any given day, and I'm certainly not going to do it starting today. Um, uh, the Vice President, I'm sure her team will give her uh, a readout of how the conversation with uh, between the President and the Prime Minister 
uh, is going right now, um, and that that will, I'm sure, inform her conversation, but I'm not gonna get more detail than that. And just a second question, what additional pressure is the president willing to exert upon Nyapu, just given that the framework, as my colleague mentioned, was just submitted about a few weeks ago <coughs> now and is still nothing has come of that? The framework for the deal? I mean, my goodness, there's, you know, I know it's, I know we don't, we're not there yet, and I, I get that there's more work to be done, but think about what has happened since he laid that out on the 31st of May. We went from uh, that framework proposal to getting the framework itself agreed to now by both sides. There's some haggling that's being done over some of the details. Uh, some of that haggling has had positive result, and we have closed some gaps. There are still gaps that remain to be closed, as I said earlier, some details that need to be worked out. There's an awful lot of energy and effort being put into this, certainly by our team, but I go, I'll go so far as to say by, uh, by our counterparts as well. You got you. Thank you, Corinne. I've got uh, two questions, but first, can you tell me the backstory behind the, the nice bling you've got around your uh, neck over there? Well, and I, uh, I had a chance to meet with um, some of the hostages' families, my, myself, uh, uh, back in December. And uh, the father of one gave me this to wear, and I try to wear it as much as I can, just to remember that, again, 293 days, they need to be home with their families. And since they're here at the White House, uh, and this is gonna be a prime topic of conversation, I thought it was appropriate to wear it today. Does the president have one? I don't know. Okay, I've got uh, two questions. Is it or is it not the U.S. government's position that UNRWA is complicit in terrorism. UNRWA does some things that no other agency can do on the ground in Gaza. You and I both know that. Now, there has been uh, an investigation done to some of their employees, and I understand that there's been some additional uh, uh, claims or charges against uh, additional employees too uh, that have been laid out there, but it's clear to us that UNRWA has taken this seriously. They fully investigated it. Uh, they eliminated the uh, employment of those that uh, they believe were involved in terrorist activities. It's absolutely unacceptable. It's not just to us, but it should be, and we believe it is unacceptable to UNRWA. But UNRWA is still, you know, e and yes, I know we're not providing funding them now because of legislation, but I think it's important for people to know that there are things that can't get done without UNRWA's cooperation and, and support on the ground. And the government's position is that those are claims and charges, right? Nothing more than claims well, and charges. Some of them have been verified because they did their own investigation, UNRWA did, and, and terminated some of those employees. So clearly, there was something to it. My second question. Um, Hezbollah has been firing thousands of rockets. At what point does that violate the president's don't, don't, don't warning? We are working, as I said in my opening statement, uh, to try to resolve the differences uh, at and around the blue line. Um, we haven't seen, um, although there has been firing back and forth across that blue line, we want to see that stop. We haven't seen it escalate uh, into an all-out war here, and nor do we want that to happen, which is why we're working so hard diplomatically to try to find a solution. One of the things that the Prime Minister and the President will talk about today is what we need to do, what more do we need to do uh, to stabilize the situation on the Blue Line so that families, both Lebanese and Israeli, can start to move back to their homes. All right, let's let the Admiral go. Go ahead, Jerry. You have the last question. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, good afternoon, Admiral. Uh, the progress that you cite uh, as it relates to sort of the phase one uh, hostage and ceasefire deal, does that signal that there has also been progress in the uh, day after uh, post-conflict uh, Gaza and sort of what that government looks like? No, those are two different processes. I mean, we're, we're, when I'm talking about progress made and gaps that can be closed, I'm talking about the ceasefire deal itself, which, as you know, has, has two phases to it. Phase one gets you six weeks of, uh, of, uh, of a ceasefire and the return of the most vulnerable, but not all, but the most vulnerable of hostages. Um, that's a separate process than what you call the day after, which is something, frankly, that Secretary Blinken's been working on since almost the day after October 7th in terms of trying to figure out with our partners on the ground, including the Israelis, but Arab partners, uh, what does governance look like when the war is over and how are the aspirations of the uh, people of Gaza actually met by a governing body and a governing authority that has an interest in, in meeting their aspirations for peace and security. How would you characterize that process right now? It's uh, ongoing, and still a lot of work is being done. I mean, if you want me to give it a you know report card, I can't do that. But I can tell you that uh, Secretary Blinken, Jake Sullivan, the whole team is still de very much dedicated to that. Okay. And John, Pope Francis reiterated this call today for a, an Olympic truce. Can you comment on that? <coughs> Great, could you? All right. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Admiral. I forgot to thank him. <laughs> um, and yesterday, uh, you asked a couple of times uh, about the, the rationale for the President's decision to tune in. One thing the President did not say was explicitly why he stepped aside. He's, you know, you talked about how he believed in the best interest of the country to step aside, but why did he, did he believe he was going to lose to Donald Trump? Look, I think that the President actually answered this question. I think, wait, no, no, no. I think the American people think he answered the question. He said, I revere this office, but I love my country more. He said, I draw strength and I enjoy in working for the American people, but this sacred task of perfecting our union is not about me. It's about you, our families, your families, your futures. And I've decided the best way, the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. He talked about unity. He talked about passing the torch. Uh, I know there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life, but there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices, and that time and place is now. That is what he said. That is why he laid out why he's passing the torch, why it's time to give, give it over to new, fresh voices. And he also talked about unity. And I would also refer back uh, to his letter, where he talked about also wanting to unify his party. Did the president believe that his presence in that race was divisive? I'm not going to get into more than what the president laid out. He talked about unity. He talked about bringing the, the party together. He talked about p putting the country first. He talked about passing over the torch, uh, bringing in new voices. I think he laid out very clearly why he decided to make this decision. And I believe the American people got it. They understood it. If it's clear, I wouldn't be asked the question, but I'll, I'll move I on. I think it's I, clear. Okay. I do. So I think the, the American people do. For several weeks, the White House has said, um, had said multiple times that the president was not going to leave the race. He ultimately did. You've also yeah. said several times that, that the president would not uh, pardon or commute the sentences for his yeah. son, Hunter. Uh, I just want to make sure that that is not going to change over the next six months. The president's it's saying still, he would not. It's still, it's still a no. It's still a no. It will always be a no. It's still a no. It will be a no. It, it is a no. And I don't have anything else to add. Will he pardon his son? No. Thank you, Train. So picking up on Zeke. Yeah, sure. For such a monumental decision, the president did address why he left the race. Well, but, thank you. But, but, but he left a lot of it for us to read between the lines. He did not make clear why he's leaving the race. Even in the excerpts that you bring up, yeah. He says that, you know, the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. Is he saying it's because he was too old? You know, in another one, he said that <clears throat> it was for the sake of democracy. Well, that does not answer why he thought he was in the way of democracy. I mean, so yeah. why I did he I make this decision? A new generation, and he also said the next sest sentence was to unite, is also to unite the nation. Uh, look. The president has talked about this twice, one in a letter that he addressed to the American people on Sunday, laying out a very monumental, to your point, it is, it is a monumental decision that he made, and he thought very long and hard. He also said that he's been serving this country as a public servant for more than 50 years. It is not an easy decision to make. He talked about unity. He talked about the next generation. He talked about passing the torch. I was asked in this room a couple of days, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, all of these days are coming together, uh, that when the president ran in 2020, he talked about passing the torch. He talked about the next generation. He talked about being a bridge to the next generation. And I was asked, is that something that the president still wants to do and still cares about? And I said, yes. And so this is part of that, right? This is part of what he said in 2020. He talked about unifying the nation. He talked about unifying the party. And he believed the time was now. The time was now to step down from his reelection uh, and to move, uh, you know, to move uh, ahead with the next six months, the end of his term, and that's what he decided to do. Before he made the decision, he said that there were three things that could sway him: the Lord Almighty, a medical condition, and if his team showed him that he could not win. Mm -hmm. So, was it because of the polling? I could just, I can tell you, it's not a medical. It uh, was not a medical. Um, decision because I've been asked before and we answer that uh, very straightforward and in a, in a very direct way. I'm just not going to get beyond that. And then finally, 
President Biden spent much of his speech talking about the choice that Americans face in November. Trump's campaign manager called it a campaign speech. Your response? My response is it's not a campaign speech. I will remind uh, my friends on the other side that the president is no longer a candidate. Yeah. Thank you, Corrine. Uh, Democrats on Capitol Hill are being handed this card with talking points about the vice president and the border. Do you know who's handing this out? I have no idea. You probably should ask her campaign. So the first one says Vice President Harris was never appointed border czar. There's never been such a position. It doesn't exist. Why are Democrats so sensitive about the vice president and the border? Why are Republicans so sensitive about actually not owning up to them getting in the way of a border deal? Why? Why won't they own up to that? Why won't they own up to the last president told them not to move forward? It was a bipartisan deal on just right there, available to them, and they voted twice against it twice against it. Why are they so sensitive to moving forward and actually dealing on an issue that majority of Americans care about is dealing with what's going on at the border. Do you think that the border would be less of a talking point now if there was less migration to the border, say if somebody had addressed root causes of migration uh, well, sooner? Wait, hold on a second. Did you not hear the beginning of my, it was, I know there were a lot of toppers, but one of the toppers I talked about what we're seeing at the border. It's down by 55%. Not because of Republicans in Congress and what they did, it's because of what this president and this vice president did. They saw, they, he moved forward and took actions to deal with what's going on at the border. Republicans continue, continue to block getting resources to the Border Patrol agents. They continue to block actually dealing with an immigration system. So yes, we are going to debunk the false, uh, the false uh, you know, characterization of the vice president, she was not a border czar. And it's not just us. Independent fact checkers have said the same thing, that that did not exist, and that is not true. And a different topic, Russia and China are teaming up in the skies near Alaska for the first time ever. Are you getting a sense yet, based on everything that's been going on, that some of America's enemies might be looking at what's happening here and think there's Nobody in charge? So let me just say this. There is very much someone in charge. The president is the president until the end of his term. So that, that, uh, that statement is certainly false. And we have seen the president bring together our allies and partners. He reinvigorated NATO. He got more than 50 countries behind Ukraine to make sure that they were able to defend themselves against Putin. He stood up to Putin, and he's done a lot more. Uh, and now, right now, as we're speaking, I believe it's still happening, the president is having a bilateral conversation meeting with the, with the prime minister of Israel. So, who, by the way, the Prime Minister of Israel thanked the President for the work that he's been, he's been able to do uh, in helping to make sure that Israel is able to have an ironclad security, right? And so that's that. But let me be clear, I want to actually address uh, your, I guess, the basis of your question uh, outside of saying there's no leadership. Our Department of Defense did not see this activity in Alaska Air Defense Identification Zone as a threat. North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, continues to monitor PRC and Russian activity near North America and to meet, uh, to meet, presence, and, uh, to meet presence with presence. U.S. and Canadian aircraft detected, tracked, and intercepted the Russian and PRC aircraft, and more broadly, the U.S. remains concerned about the PRC and Russian collaboration across all instruments of national power that do not promote global stability and security, not just the, in the Arctic, uh, but the president, if anything, if you look at uh, his foreign policy objectives and what he's been able to do and what the last administration did, they, the last administration ruined our relationships with our partners and allies. This president had to fix that and make sure that we, we actually <clears throat> mended our relationship with our partners and allies. And that's what we've been able to do. And a perfect example is what we're seeing with Ukraine being able to defend itself against Russia's aggression. Okay. So yesterday and again today you insisted that the president didn't make this decision because of a medical condition. It wasn't about his health. Yesterday you said that he couldn't finish a second term if, you, if he won one. So was this decision to step out of the race just a political calculus? He just didn't think it could beat Trump. I don't have anything else to add to what the president said himself last night, to what he penned and released to the American people on Sunday. Don't have anything more to add to that. 
He wanted to unite the country. He wanted to pass the torch. He felt after 50, 50 plus years of public service, the time was to do just that. I don't have anything else to add. Do you have anything to add on what he teased about proposing reform to the Supreme Court? So um, that is something certainly that the president would talk to more about in the whole, in you know in the upcoming weeks. Just for so folks who may have missed that, he said last night. He said, "I'm going to call for Supreme Court reform because this is critical to our democracy. Supreme Court reform." And I answered this question, uh, this part. I said this part of uh, to a question yesterday. He believes if you are serving in uh, at high in high office, you should be held to a transparency, accountability, and you should be held to uh, a high ethics. That's what the president believes. I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the president, and he will have more uh, to share with all of you soon. Can't time. Um, just, I know many of my colleagues have asked these yeah. questions, and just given the historic nature of the announcement and the decision, I think it's important to get some more transparency. You just said that the president thought long and hard about the decision to exit the race, mm -hmm. but also yesterday you said that he made the decision on Saturday night and prior yeah, to that. The right there's, there's, I, he could still think about something long and hard if he started thinking about it on Saturday night and finally made his decision on Sunday. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a I mean that's a, that's your that's your that's your yeah, assumption. Sure, it's, it's but you know, but that's your that that is your assumption. Not everybody will have that same assumption or thought, right? I mean, it is it is a decision that he felt that he needed to make and that was that was that was the, the, the TikTok of it, if you will. Uh, we were laying out to you how it happened, and that's how it happened. How, that's how the president said it happened. Um, and do you expect the president to address any further his decision-making process, as my colleagues have asked? Yeah. We don't feel that we have gotten the clarity about how he made this monumental decision, and so obviously we would love an opportunity to ask him questions himself, but barring that, do yeah. you think we should expect any uh, more clarity? Look, I'm not going to, the president's going to, make his decision on his own on how much more he wants to share. Obviously, he gave an oval address and addressed the American people, as he said he was going to do in his letter back on Sunday. And he had a letter on Sunday as well. Maybe there's, there'll be more that he wants to share. We have six months. Uh, certainly, the president enjoys taking all of your questions. Or he'll continue to do just that. Uh, I don't have anything to share beyond what you've heard from the president on Sunday and his oval address to the American people last night. Just one last one on sort of the next six months. Uh, we just asked Kirby about this, but is there anything you can tell us about how operations at the White House may change, the president's schedule may change, anything else that reflects obviously is a lot more time now that he's not going to be a full-time candidate? I mean, you're right. He has a lot more time now. He won't be a candidate. That is true. Uh, and the president said he wants to continue his, obviously, as he was doing before, continue uh, and solely focused on uh, being president and what that means and for the American people and delivering and building on unprecedented successes that he's been able uh, to get done, right? We still have a lot more to do. Uh, we still have to make sure there are I was just out about the Supreme Court, right? He mentioned that in his speech. I won't get ahead of that. That is something that he cares about. Uh, the ethics, right, and transparency, something he wants to make sure that that is addressed. Again, not going to get ahead of the president, but he gave a little bit of that. He laid out what he's done for almost four years and making sure we're building on that, whether it's uh, continuing to lower costs. He <laughs> talked about that bringing down inflation, creating good paying jobs. All of these historic legislation that he was able to get done, they still have to be implemented, right? Whether it's this, uh, the, uh, the um, Chips and Science Act, whether it's the Infrastructure Bill, uh, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, there's still a lot of work to get done to make sure that we deliver the good things, the good components of those, uh, those uh, now laws uh, to the American people. Still a lot to get done. He's focused on it, and we'll certainly, we will certainly have more to share. As you know, he's going to be going to Austin on Monday, uh, and so you know, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Go ahead. Thank you, Karim. So after uh, President Biden said he was going to step aside and endorse uh, Vice President Harris, Democrats quickly coalesced around uh, Vice President Harris. I was wondering if President Biden. Uh, sought assurances from other leading, uh, you know, Democratic <coughs> candidates that they would challenge her, that they wouldn't challenge her. I, I'm not going to get into specifics or behind-the-scenes conversation. I'm just not. And, and also, that's kind of on the campaign, the political side, so going to be careful from here. Look, I think it's important that what we saw the first 48 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours after the president decided not to run, uh, the coalescing of support behind the vice president, which is not surprising. 
She has been a partner, a critical partner to this president in, in everything that we have been able to successfully get done, uh, some historic items that we've been able to get done. She's been a critical partner to this president. She has four years, almost four years of experience as vice president, also as a senator, also as attorney general. Uh, she has an impressive resume, and uh, I have said this before, and I'll say it again, I do not see, and the president obviously did not see anyone else who would be more qualified to step in. And so it is not surprising uh, that she got the support that she has and continues to get uh, and the president certainly is going to uh, continue to support her. Uh, thanks Kareem. The president uh, praised Vice President Harris last night in his address as a good partner and a strong leader. Will he have any objections if she starts creating a little bit of distance with him on any policy areas? Look, um, certainly um, I can't speak to how she's going to move forward with her campaign on policy issues. That's something that the campaign would have to address directly. I, I would say, again, kind of repeating myself but saying this in a little bit different way, the last four years uh, has been very successful policy-wise. Uh, they've been able to get things done. Uh, they've been able to turn around the economy. We have not to forget, we should not forget, what happened when the president and the vice president stepped into their roles, right? They stepped into the presidency, the administration. Uh, we had a once in a century pandemic that the president turned us around uh, and with the help of the vice president. You think about the American Rescue Plan, you think about Inflation Reduction Act. Many of these legislation, she played a role in getting it across the aisle. She also presides, right, uh, in the Senate, right? She, she really, gave us some really important uh, in, important votes in getting things done. So they've been partners in this. You know, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals here about which, how she's going to move forward with her campaign. Uh, but um, you think about crime, you think about health care, you think about the economy, you think about immigration and the successes that we have seen in those uh, particular areas, and that's just a few, foreign policy. She's been in par a partner of that, in that. Sure, and she'll no doubt yeah. have to run on the record that they have together, but the relationship has changed a little bit. She's not just a supporter vice president now, she's also the candidate and the candidate for the party going forward in the election. So if she decides to show a little bit more of her own views on Gaza, for example, is the president okay with that? Look, uh, a hypothetical that I don't want to go down a rabbit hole in, what I say is that uh, the president respects uh, the vice president. He endorsed her, believing that, uh, as I said, passing, passing the torch to the next generation of new voices, uh, that she was more than qualified uh, to do the job, more than qualified uh, to step in on day one, as he said himself. I'm just repeating him. Uh, and I think that says volumes coming from a president who's been a senator, who's been a vice president, right, who knows how this place works, who knows how Congress works, now who knows what it's like to be president of the United States. I think uh, that is, uh, uh, I think coming from this president says a lot. I don't want to get into um, hypotheticals here. They are uh, pretty much have been uh, hand in glove, if you will, uh, these past four years on getting things done on the different policy issues, uh, and I suspect that will continue. Good, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Um, you mentioned now about what the president said last night about the vice president, but one thing he didn't do was explicitly tell Americans to vote for her. He said, now the choice is up to you, the American people. Why not use that moment when he had millions of people tuned in to say that message flat out? Because he was being mindful. This was an oval address. This was not a campaign political address. This was an oval address. And he thought it was important uh, as he is... He said it. He started off uh, his remarks talking about being at the Resolute Desk, talked about the space and the portraits that were in the room, the busts that were in the room, the importance, the heavy weight of that office. And he believed this was a monumental decision, as many of you have reminded me today, that he made. And he wanted to take that opportunity to talk through what he's been able to deliver, to talk about what it meant for him to be president, an honor of a lifetime. Uh, and, you know, to lay out what this next six months is going to be. And so that's what he wanted to focus on. There will be many, plenty of time, plenty of times for him to uh, go out on the campaign trail and talk about choices and talk about what it, what's, what's at stake. I'm going to be very careful here, but there will be plenty of time to do that. Um, he didn't feel like that was 
the time to do that was last night. And can you tell us a little bit about the after the speech? We know from yeah. some social media posts, we could hear it here that yeah. the president walked yeah. out to the Rose Garden yeah. and several hundred staff were out there. But um, what was that like? What did yeah. he do afterwards, private time with family? Just tell us how yeah, his mood it was. was look, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Uh, the president uh, went to the Rose Garden. There were hundreds of staff cheering him on. Uh, very proud to have been part of this administration, many of us for since the beginning of this administration, almost four years. Uh, and he also wanted to appreciate the staff. He knows how hard it's been, not just the past three and a half years, but certainly the past couple of weeks. And so I think it was a very special moment, a uh, very proudful moment for the staff here. I was there out in the Rose Garden. Uh, got to listen to him speak off the cuff and say thank you. Uh, and talk about, you know, the work that we have been able to get done, the historic amount of work that we've been get, able to get done, and what's ahead the next six months. So yes, there were hundreds of staff here in the Rose Garden. Uh, we some some of us, uh, I, I was able to uh, be in the Oval and and watch the president deliver the remarks. Uh, many of the staffers were able to watch together here uh, at the White House in the residence, uh, and afterwards we all came together and uh, cheered on. Uh, the president and thanked him and so i think and he was able to thank us and appreciate us as well okay john just following up on that kareem what's the mood of the staff right now i think is it is oh i'm sorry no it's all right sorry. i'm just curious is, is there melancholy what what's 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 the exact mood right now i think it's a little bit of what i just said to karen i think there's a lot of pride in the work that we've been able to get done on under this leadership of this president uh, i think that there's a lot of understanding. There's a lot more work to be done in the next six months. We're energized. Uh, and look, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm going to be very honest. It's been hard. It's been very hard. Uh, you know, when you, when you do these jobs, uh, you believe in the work ahead. You believe in the leadership of the person that you're working for, this person being Joe Biden. And so it was, uh, it, it has been a tough couple of weeks. But we are so we are so full of pride of what we've been able to get done, and now there's six months left. I, I noticed, and maybe I, I misread yeah. it, but when you had your uh, prepared remarks at the very top, it seemed as if you, you got a little emotional talking yeah. a little bit. Of, no, I missed that. Yeah. Let's read that. No, I mean no. I mean it is. Emo I mean I've said it. It's an emotional moment for everyone, you know, including me. It's an emotional moment, you know. This is uh, you know you do these jobs. Uh, they don't they don't pay all that well as you know <laughs> you guys have tough jobs as well and it takes you away from your family uh, you don't sleep as much <laughs> uh, they are you know 24 7 jobs for sure and you do it because you believe in the work whether you're whichever side of the aisle you're in right I would hope and think that people who do these jobs believe that you're gonna make people's lives better right or you're very much connected to the issues that you're working on. I think that's important. So yes, it's emotional. It's emotional. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what would the president say to those who have increased the attack on vice president based on the color of the skin, the gender, even call using terms like lunatics? So look, um, there's something I do want to say about that. When you have the lead, the uh, speaker of the house, obviously he's a Republican. Uh, and this is something that you all have reported, set up a meeting to tell Republican leaders to stop being racist, to stop being misogynist, to stop being sexist. I think that says a lot, that they have to be told to not do that. Uh, but more broadly, I think, it's, uh, I think it's desperate, I think it's uh, disgusting, and I think it's a dog whistle. Uh, and we, ha we should not forget she is the vice president of the United States. She's the vice president of the United States. She should get that respect. She's been doing this job with the president for f almost four years. She's a former senator and has been a critical partner in getting the economy re restarted in making sure that, uh, uh, that we deal with the pandemic. And to hear that is frankly disgusting. I have one more question to follow up on the proper about legal. what you said about the legal immigration system in, at the top of your remarks. Yeah. There are around 200,000 American kids who came to this country at the age of maybe six months, two years, but they're all facing 
deportation as they age out at 21 years of age. Uh, around 40 senators and congressmen wrote a letter to the administration that coming out with some legal mechanism so that they can stay in this country. That many of them are doing quite well. What would the president be doing for them? I mean, look, I, I, certainly we don't have any policy uh, announcements to make at this time. But again, I talked about the bipartisan agreement that came uh, together uh, from the Senate, uh, where we negotiated uh, a process to help the so-called documented uh, dreamers, and sadly, Republicans. And I've said this many times already at this podium uh, today, which is that they voted it down twice. They voted it down twice. Uh, and as I said at the top, um, you know, we are going to provide protection to more than 500,000 people and keep families together in the U.S. That is something that the president announced back in June, and that is something that we're going to continue to do. Look, the way to get to deal with a broken Im immigration system is to get legislative process done and move forward. We started that. Republicans voted it down twice. We had a bipartisan option. That would have been the toughest and the fairest way to move forward in dealing with the immigration system, something we hadn't seen in years. And they voted it down twice. And so that is how we're going to move forward, is making sure Congress gets done, the work done that they need to. I know I think I have to right back <laughs> get, get it. Thanks, great. The two topics, the, the economy first, if I could. Sure. There's a new CN CNN poll out that says 39% uh, of adults worry most of the time or all of the time that their income will not be enough to meet expenses. Uh, prices are up 19% since President Biden and Kamala Harris, so the vice president, came into office. Mm -hmm. How long do Americans have to wait till this worry goes away? So look, too many, too many families are still struggling to make ends meet. That is something that the president understands, and that is why he works every single day to make sure that we address these issues for hardworking Americans. I talked about the historic accomplishments that this president has done. You think about the inflation. Reduction Act, which only Democrats voted for, insulin is now capped at 35 bucks a month for seniors. The president wants to see that go more broadly. This goes into the question that I was asked: What else does he want to do? Continue to lower costs, right? Uh, you think about um, uh, you think about what he's been able to do to get housing assistance uh, for Americans who are having a hard time with rent, with getting a house. And so he's, he, is, he uh, is, has taken actions to deal with that, with that issues that Americans have. We get it. We get it. Over the next six months, that's what we want to continue to focus on as well. Uh, and we know that Americans, again, have, are, are uh, having a difficult time. But our stance and where we, how we see this country is very clear. Republicans want to give a tax break to corporations, a big tax giveaway to corporations and billionaires. They want to actually go after Social Security and Medicare. That's not what we believe. That's not what we want to do. We want to protect those important programs that Americans need. So if I could, the other topic. Last night, the president kept with the theme of saving democracy, alluding to the fact that maybe former President Trump is a threat to democracy. The vice president is using the same language. Is this a dangerous rhetoric? Look, it is important that we continue to talk about unity. It is. Saving democracy, making sure that we're unified as a country. And he called on the country to come together. That is something that, that is a, that is a theme that he's talked about since 2019. Since 2019. Nothing new here. And I'll quote, keep calling out hate and extremism. Make it clear there is no place, no place in America for political violence. That's something that the president said last night. Or any violence ever. Period. I'm going to keep speaking out to protect our kids and gun violence. This is something that the president truly believes in. But bringing the country together is a big part. Of it. That is actually the theme. Unity is the theme that you heard from his, his remarks last night. Go ahead, Jenny. But he, still, but he still talks about a threat to democracy. I mean, there are now three public attempts that were or threats uh, to the former president that, that we know of, yeah. uh, Iran being one of them, <laughs> the shooter the other night. So how many threats are enough to lower the temperature? The president has called on lowering the temperature. But here's the thing, Ed. It takes on all of us to lower the temperature. All of us. I hope you can read between the lines of what I mean by all of us. It takes all of us to take that action and to lower the temperature. And I think when you have a president that uses the Oval Address to talk about unity, not just once, he did it right after, sadly, right after uh, the former president, the attempted 
uh, assass assassination on the former president, talked about lowering the temperature then, and also talked about really denouncing, condemning political violence and how it has no place in this nation. He talked about, he used the Oval Office to do just that. And we've been condemning political violence for some time. Go ahead, Jenny. Um, passing the torch obviously was the central theme yesterday of, of the Many address. themes. Okay, one of the central themes. Uh, and you just mentioned his commitment in 2020 to run as a bridge candidate. Two weeks ago at the NATO press conference, he was asked exactly that, and what changed, why he's not doing us anymore. He said, what changed was the gravity of the situation I inherited in terms of the economy, our foreign policy, and domestic division. Obviously, since the presser, none of these factors have changed. So I think it's a fair question for all of us to ask you if you can help us understand the, it the is shift in thinking. I, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Jenny. Made Go ahead, him sorry. arrive at this conclusion that passing the torch now is the right time. And it is a fair question to ask. I don't have anything else to add to what the president said. I'm not going to get ahead of this president. I'm just not. He, he put out a letter and he said what he wanted to say about the situation last night. I'm not going to get ahead of it. I'm not saying it's a, not a fair question to ask. I do not have anything more to add than what the president said. Yes, he talked about passing the torch. He talked about unity. He talked about bringing the country together. That is what he wanted to share to the American people. If there is more to say, he certainly, I will leave that to him to say that. I don't have anything and else to add. Quick thing, obviously, Kirby just teased that there might be opportunities for trips or legacy uh, engagements in the next six months. Is there anything you have talked to him about, something that he wants to do before he leaves office? I think he's still thinking through it. You know, I think that uh, I think that it's going to be a process. We have a lot of things that we want to get done domestically in foreign policy space. NSC is thinking through it. The president's thinking through it. And when we have more to share, we certainly will share that with all of you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right. Bye.